The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No. And thank you uh, for joining us today in this wonderful cathedral. For those of you at home watching on television, thank you for joining us tonight uh, to what I guess you could call the Our Lady of Cable Access. Thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, God is in the house with us tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, God has indeed a blessing for us. As we start tonight, as you came in the church doors, you were given a uh, piece of paper. For those of us who don't have the piece of paper, uh, we're going to do a little reading. The reading is in the back of your hymnal, page uh, 389, if you'd like to join us. If you would, please, uh, congregation, stand, and let's read together our reading for, for this evening, okay? Are we ready? Okay. O oh Lord, our omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, really big God, we come before you in humble adoration, recognizing God the Almighty, all-powerful, angry father figure, Jesus, our loving friend and good buddy, and the Holy Spirit, a ghost-like thing nobody can really understand. We worship you because, well, that's what we're supposed to do, and because it's always been done that way in the past. Who are we to question anything? Oh God, we are like lowly worms to you. We are bugs to be squashed beneath your omnipotent feet. You are so perfect, while we are so helpless and ignorant the way a Christian should be. We come before you with prayer and with music that no one can dance to. And we come before your holy presence, kneeling in fear and awe, knowing that sometimes you get very angry about little things and kill people for it. We pray that you will help us not to think about the things that we believe. Help us to remain stupid. For we know that it is through our ignorance, by our intellectual suicide, that we are made holy. Help us to take all bait set before us to be reeled in like fish by the religious leaders of the world. Help us always to shove our religion in other people's faces, and grant us the strength to persecute anyone who believes differently than we do, to bomb abortion clinics, to beat up gay people, and to do it all in your name. For to do it in God's name makes it okay. Amen. Thank you very much. You may all be seated now. Uh, if you remember in our last session, uh, we chose some verses out of the Bible, just sort of at random. We let the Holy Spirit guide our fingers through the Bible. And, well, frankly, that didn't work out quite like we had expected it to. Uh, we ran across verses that were contradictory, or, or at least they may seem to be contradictory on the surface. Now, we know that the Bible is the holy, inerrant, perfect Word of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But there are verses that we can't, we don't understand. These verses that seem to go against other verses, we had some problems with that. So today what I'd like to do, just to be safe, uh, I'd like to read some just of the sayings of Jesus. I brought my red letter Bible with me, uh, which of course, you know, highlights the sayings of Jesus in red. So let's take a look at some of those, if you will. Uh, we'll start... Uh, well, Mark's got a bunch. Why don't we start right here? Mark 10, 21, um, where he says, Jesus looked at him, had love for him, for this man, and said, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven. Come and follow me. 
Well, maybe we should find another one. We don't really, I, I haven't sold everything I have and given it to the poor, and I don't, I don't think Jesus really meant for all Christians to do that. Let, let's find another one. Um, uh, how about if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off? Well, that's, I think that's taken it a little too far. Uh, you know, some of these verses have sort of a, a spiritual message, I think, and uh, are, are not meant to be taken literally. And we as Christians uh, are blessed to have the Holy Spirit secret decoder ring that helps us know which to take literally and which not to. Thank God for that. Let's find another saying of Jesus. Uh, he said, Jesus said, uh, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until the Son of Man comes again. Now, back at the time when Jesus was about to be crucified, when he was crucified, after he was crucified, people believed that Jesus was going to come back to earth, the, the second coming uh, that we think of today, uh, that it was going to happen before those people who were alive then even died. They were waiting for Jesus right then and right there. And Jesus says here, he himself says that he's going to come back before some of those people die. But of course that didn't happen. Let's find another verse. <clears throat> that one didn't, uh, didn't work very well. Here's one where he says, take no thought for the morrow. Well, now, of course, we don't really, we don't really follow that one either. I just planted some trees, and I know we invest in the stock market, and uh, we don't really follow that one either. I know Jesus said it and everything, but uh, that doesn't, well, I don't want to say it doesn't make it true, but uh, I don't know. Figure it out for yourself. We'll come to that one another time. We'll discuss that one later. Uh, Jesus said, whoever smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the left. Well, of course, Jesus only means that in some circumstances, uh, not all circumstances, certainly not with the military or time of war, certainly not, uh, and uh, Lord knows God did his share of smiting in the Old Testament. Uh, let's find another saying of Jesus, okay? This isn't quite working out like I <clears throat> had intended it to either. Uh, how about judge not lest ye be judged? No, that would kind of ruin our court system, wouldn't it? I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's just move on to something else. Uh, I have some announcements that we need to make before we get into today's sermon. Uh, don't forget that coming up, our annual spring youth retreat. Oh, praise God, what a wonderful thing this is going to be. Our youth from our church are going to go to a week-long camp. They are going to be inundated have the Bible pounded into their head with just sermons and Bible studies studies uh, for, a, for an entire week. When they come back, you won't be able to recognize them. They've been uh, washing cars, raising money to help defray the cost of this a little bit, and God's going to bless those efforts. Um, when they come back, they will be so full of biblical knowledge and good Christian values, you won't even recognize them. Uh, they're going to come back insecure, naive, scared of the world, the way that all good Christian teenagers should be. Uh, they'll be full of good, decent Christian values, biblical teachings. Uh, uh, we're going to have Brother John Smith, who's going to be preaching twice a day, every morning and every evening. There'll be a sermon with a little sermonette at noontime. And, of course, little sessions of Bible study in between the sermons and throughout the day. Brother, John, or Brother Smith will be teaching... Uh, on a few things, one in particular is the evils, the evils of sex. Let's just say relations, shall we? I don't like the word sex. During that week, they'll learn what the Apostle Paul said about sex and about lust. You know, a lot of, a lot of people in this world, especially those scientists, think that a teenager's desire for relations is, is natural and biological. They think that it's some sort of hormonal rush that they get. Well, it's not. It's Satan. It's the devil in them. And John Smith, good brother John Smith, is going to help get rid of some of that. It's not biological. It's not natural to think about it. It is satanic. It is Satan to think about relations. And our kids are going to learn not to do that. They're going to come back with their heads held in shame for thinking about it. 
the way Christian kids should be. They're going to they're gonna learn that Christians should be ashamed of thinking like that. They'll, they'll feel terrible about themselves as bad people for thinking about relations. Praise God. Amen. I thank God for Billy and Susan down here. Thank you for coming, Billy. Billy and Susan, some of the uh, teenagers here in our church, they, they took the Apostle Paul's words to heart. The Apostle Paul says that if you, if you absolutely have to have relations, then it's better to go ahead and be married. Well, thank God for Billy and Susan. They did just that. Uh, 15-year-old teenagers, they decided that they could no longer uh, hold out and to be good Christian examples, they went to Mexico and got married. Uh, Susie is now pregnant with a child. But praise God, they're, they're following Paul's example. Uh, of course, Susie has to go to a, a special school. Uh, Billy will, or Susie will never go to college. Billy's going to have to drop out of high school to support uh, Susie and the new baby. But praise God, he'll help them through it somehow. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Billy and Susie, for setting such a good example and, uh, and showing people what to do. Also, don't forget to let your kids bring their CDs with them, their secular music CDs, that is, because we are going to have a little bonfire at this, this year's retreat. We are going to help burn some of these albums, uh, these CDs. So, sorry, showing my age here. Not albums anymore. CDs. Uh, this, this music that teaches kids to to take drugs and to speak terrible language and to think about relations. We're going to get rid of all that. Put these kids on the right track. We're also going to be teaching them that God's people are right. They're going to learn that we can do just about whatever we want to do as long as we do it in Jesus' name. And what I mean by whatever we want to do, of course, I mean our war with Satan our war with the devil, our war with the secular humanists out there who think that they can just pull God out of our schools. Next thing, they're going to try to pull God out of our churches. We're not going to stand for it. We're going to stand by and we're going to wage God's war against these people. And whatever we do, if we do it in God's name, then by golly, it is okay. And your kids are going to come back learning that. I don't care what any of these fake religions say. Your kids are going to learn to keep in God we trust in the currency. This is a Christian nation. God built this nation. The word Christ, that's where we get Christian from. It's not, it's, it's not in Allah we trust. It's in God we trust. We're going to keep in God we trust on our currency. And I will fight and die for the right to say the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under who? Under Buddha? I don't think so. One nation under God. And I don't care what Buddhists think. There may be five million Muslims in the United States. Well, they can go get their own currency. They want to stay in America? Then it's in God we trust on our currency. Amen? This is a Christian nation. By golly, and it will stay that way. And your kids are going to learn to fight and do whatever it takes to beat moral values into the Americans in this nation if they can't keep up. If they can't get on the train and go with the rest of us, then they're, they're in for a war that they won't like. And they'll lose that war because we have God on our side. Just like God is in the Super Bowl. You know that. You've heard them praise God after the plays they make. God cares about our lives. That's a thought for another time. We won't get into that. So be sure your kids sign up for this spring's youth retreat. This is going to be a wonderful thing. They are going to come back unrecognizable. Also, don't forget about our toddler program. Uh, we want to be sure and brainwash kids as soon as we can so that when they become adults and uh, start to really think for themselves, uh, it'll be harder for them to leave Christianity. And that's what we want to do. So the earlier that we can pound into their head uh, the scripture, the Bible, and traditional Christian things, the harder it will be for them to leave it later. So uh, please help support the new uh, toddler program. If your kids are not involved in that, 
please be sure and uh, get your kids involved. Um, I do have one other announcement, uh, a sad announcement. Uh, I'm sad to report to you that Brother Johnson, who has had a long fight with cancer, passed away yesterday. Funeral services will be held Tuesday. Uh, as almost everyone in this church knows, Brother Johnson fought a long seven-year battle with cancer. Uh, and almost everyone in this church, six, seven hundred, well, it depends on if it's summer or winter and or maybe a holiday. I mean, uh, a lot of our congregation <laughs> doesn't really believe the things that we say. They just come on those special holidays to help them feel better about themselves. But as long as they tithe, that's okay with me. Uh, anyway, all six or seven hundred people we had in this church praying for Brother Johnson. Brother Johnson used to be a missionary, of course, in China, um, in India, and uh, other foreign countries, California. Um, he was a missionary in all of those three places. So we have those people who started praying for him. Uh, I know when he was first diagnosed with cancer, we took him into the, into the side prayer room. Myself, a few of the deacons uh, laid hands on him, prayed for him, anointed him with oil, commanded that demon of cancer to leave him. That was seven years ago. Um, so we had everybody in the church praying. We've got people in, in other countries around the world praying. The, uh, the nice folks at the mission board had people all over the nation, uh, churches everywhere, praying for Brother Johnson. Um, literally thousands and thousands of people praying several times a day uh, for seven years. Uh, nothing happened. <clears throat> uh, of course, you know, it, it, we say that nothing happened, but we as Christians like to tell ourselves that God just said no. Um, why? Mm, it helps us sleep better. Uh, we may tell ourselves sometimes that uh, something good will come out of it. For all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Right? Amen? Absolutely. So I know that God has a plan. Something good is going to come out of Brother Johnson's seven-year torture with cancer. Uh, something good will come out of it. I don't know what it is, but... Uh, uh, I'm sure that it will. And saying that, like I say, helps us sleep better. And you don't have to think about it anymore. See, God doesn't want you to think about the things that you believe. Just profess to believe it. That's all that matters. Don't think about it. Just profess to believe it, uh, and, and everything will be okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in our sermon today, because I want to talk to you about prayer. Let's do that. I titled this sermon today, God Does Answer Prayer. God answers prayer, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. God answers prayer. If God's answer to prayer in your life, I'd ask you to just raise your hand if you would. Now, of course, you can't see this at home. Almost every hand is up. If God answered a prayer this week, raise your hand. Hands up everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if God answered a prayer that could not have possibly happened Think about this. The things that have happened could not have possibly happened any other way. Raise your hand. Well, okay. Well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Um, it's, see, God doesn't want us to, to ask to pray for things that are eh, too miraculous. God wants us to pray for things that uh, are hard to really hard to see. Like he doesn't want us to pray for broken bones that they'll go back together. Now, that's a little bit too much of a miracle. We like to pray for things, uh, either undiagnosed diseases, they don't know what it is, uh, or something like maybe leukemia or uh, something like that. Something that you can't really see a miracle happen. And there's a reason for that. God doesn't want us to test him. Now I know that Jesus said if you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, say to this mountain, move, and the mountain will move. That's just another one of those first things Jesus said that, uh, well, we don't really believe. <clears throat> um, but uh, we, we shouldn't waste our time praying for things that are so visible. Pray for the invisible things. Pray for things that would probably happen in the same amount of time anyway, even if you didn't pray. That way, see... We can claim victory either way. It's up to us. So uh, 
You know what they say about a cold, for instance. If you, if you have a cold and you don't do anything about it, the cold will go away in about seven days. It'll work itself through in seven days. If you have a cold and you do take medicine for it, it'll go away in about a week. Same thing, right? Seven days, week, week, seven days, treated, untreated. Well, I'm here to tell you that if you prayed for that person with a cold, God will heal that person in about seven days. But now, see, in that, we can, we can claim God's victory in that. Uh, so don't stop praying for people. Go ahead and, and pray for them like that. Now, that, when it comes to medicine, that brings up a good question. Why do we go to a doctor? I mean, if, if God, if you pray to be healed, or for someone else to be healed, God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, he's there, he has what it takes to fix it, and he knows whether or not it ought to be fixed. And you pray to fix it. First of all, why do we have to pray? I don't know, God wants us to pray. So we pray for this person. I mean, if it needed to be taken care of, God sees it, can do it, he'd do it on his own, but... Somehow he wants us to pray for him, to him maybe. So we pray for this person. Uh, now if God's going to heal him, he'll be healed, fine. What if God doesn't want to heal him? What if the answer is no? Well, then if you send him to the doctor, aren't you kind of ticking God off there? We're kind of going around him, going over his head maybe, huh? Uh, what's the answer to that? Why do you send him to the doctor? If God says no then if you go to the doctor, aren't you actually doing what it is exactly God does not want you to do? Because God doesn't want this person to be healed. He said, no! Well, the way I look at it is, God needs our help. And God wants to heal us through the medicine. So if you're sick and you take medicine, you can praise God for it. That's the way I do it, okay? Uh, God does absolutely answer prayer. He answers prayer for me all the time. God helps me, uh, what, just last week. I went to the shopping mall and there were cars. Whoo, my God, there were cars everywhere. I thought I'd never get a parking space. And I, right there in the parking lot, I said, God, please help me find a parking space. And I circled around about 30 minutes and there it was, right there in the front. One popped up. Now, you may think that it's the circling for 30 minutes that did it, but it's not. God gave me that parking place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God answers prayer for me like that all the time. A couple of days ago, my sister called me. My sister Linda called me on the phone, and she said, Brother, I, am, I have the worst, nastiest, most terriblest, worstest headache I've ever had in my life. She was literally doubled over in pain in her bed, grabbing her head and screaming and crying. She was in horrible pain. One of those headaches that make you queasy in your stomach, and it was the worst thing I've ever seen. And I said, well, sis, come on over. She did. I laid hands, my hands on her head. I prayed for her, anointed her with oil, commanded that headache demon to leave in the name of Jesus. Linda went home took six tablets of 500 milligrams of Motrin, and the next morning when she woke up, you know what? That headache was gone. That headache was gone. Praise God, that headache was gone. Now, you may say that it was the six tablets, 500 milligrams of Motrin each, that did away with that, uh, but I know better. God healed her. Not that medicine, amen? God healed her. God did that. In fact, that headache could have been a sign of a tumor. In fact, I think it was. I'm sure it was. God healed that tumor. Amen. Praise God. We can claim victory. God helps me all the time when I pray. Thank you, Deacon Burt. Deacon Burt's over there looking at his watch, tapping, telling me what time it is. I'll try to wrap this up shortly. I pray to Jesus for everything in my life. God helps me catch more fish, finds me parking spaces. God helps me eat more food at the all-you-can-eat buffet, get my money's worth. God has even healed my car. Well, I put new spark plugs in it, but it was really God that healed it. 
Amen. God does answer prayer. I'd like to share something for you, uh, share something with you here that I received an email recently uh, about the center of the Bible. What's the shortest chapter in the Bible? Psalms 117. The longest chapter is Psalms 119. The uh, center of the Bible, of course, is Psalms 118. There are 594 chapters in front of it, 594 chapters after it. When you get it all together, it adds up to 1,188, 1188. What's the center verse in the Bible? Psalms 118, colon 8, 1188. Does this say something significant about God's perfect will for our lives? And this person in the email said, yes, God's right in the center. And you know, I thank God for secret messages like that. He doesn't tell us things outright that we have to dig into little things. People that don't have a life dig this stuff up. I think that's wonderful. Uh, you may not know it, but uh, President Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy, warned him not to go to the theater. President Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln, warned him not to go to Dallas. Does God have a message in this? Absolutely. Absolutely. God's telling us, listen to our secretaries, especially when they warn us about things. The Redskins, the Washington Redskins, in the game prior to an election, in an election year, their game prior to the election, if they win, the incumbent party won that election. If they lost, the incumbent party lost the election. That's happened for over eight elections now. What are the odds of that? Enormous. Does that mean God's in the middle of it? Absolutely. Because God cares about football. And God tells us who to vote for through the Washington Redskins. And you should look at, at things like that, those kind of statistics, and look for messages from God. I thank God for secretaries, football, and secret hidden messages. If you have a moment before we go, let's say a prayer, would you? Bow with me. Dear God, we come before you tonight asking you, Tell us what's going on because we don't always, don't always understand things that are in the Bible, even things that Jesus said we don't understand. Uh, we just come to you tonight humbly with love in our hearts and say, what's up? Why can't you give us something a little more clear? Help us to believe, God, without thinking. Help us to take our beliefs and profess those beliefs without thinking about what they really mean. Help us to, like, like in the, the movie, Peter Pan, they said, I believe, I believe, I believe, and then they could fly. And God, we ask you to do the same for us. Help us, give us the strength to, to just believe without thinking. Help us to be that sheep. What are sheep? Sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the earth, almost. And they just follow the one, the other sheep with a bell around his neck. And we just, we have the preachers who are like the sheep with a bell around our neck. And Jesus is our shepherd. And we just, I know, God, that you want us to just be dumb sheep. To not think about anything. But to just take what people say with a silver spoon and, and, and just go from there. Help us not to think. Help us to be stupid and ignorant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Hope that you'll join us again another time for Showers of Blessing. I'm Reverend Don, full of it, and you better believe it. Have a good time. Go home, drive safe, and we'll see you again. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan, sin fry. No person can deny, 